Uh, well, thanks everybody for for coming to this uh, this new event in um, Merging Minds, and the event is called Representation and Intuition: AI and the Future of Design by by Sean Hanna. Uh, in the past lecture series, as I was actually discussing now with Sean, we've been talking about creativity from a more applied perspective, trying to figure out how to actually produce design, generate uh, forms, shapes, images, whatever it is, and try to turn it into architectural space. Um, but now we are going to be talking more about the implications of these algorithms into thinking about creativity, creativity itself. Uh, somehow, AI and machine learning uh, this is sort of like a, um, it's a sort of, well, it's, it's a discipline thinking about how to get machines learn, recognize patterns, understand patterns, or sort of like understand reality in a particular way. And somehow it also provides us with a way of thinking uh, about about ourselves, about uh, the way in which we think ourselves. Uh, and Sean is somebody that is clearly working on all of that. He has theorized a lot about how do we use these technologies to think about our creative process itself. And that's what he's going to be talking today about. Uh, the talk we discuss how machines can participate in the creative process and reflect on how artificial intelligence may thereby shape the future of design. Uh, Sean is professor of design computing at the Bartlett School of Architecture in UCL and a member of the UCL Space Syntax Laboratory, which is one of the UK's leading groups in built environment research. His research is primarily in developing computational methods for dealing with complexity in design and the built environment, including the comparative modeling of space and the use of machine learning and optimization techniques for the design and fabrication of structures. Uh, so without further ado, I leave the ground for Sean to uh, talk us about this topic. Thank you. So thanks thank for very, coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, and thank you all, uh, all of you who I, I can't see at the moment for uh, for coming. And it's, um, that was actually a very good introduction to what I'll be talking about. So I don't need to make uh, quite so much here, but I, I will be showing a, a few examples of my own work and my colleagues and students work today. But I'll, I'll also be, I won't be going into too much depth on the specific examples. I'll, I'll be taking this time to, to draw together more of a, a theoretical framework, how I think they fit in in the context of design. And particularly in this talk, I'll be talking about the relationship between the representations we use when we're designing uh, and uh, the relevance to representation uh, in computation and uh, what it means for design and uh, ultimately for thought. I want to start with this example, which is uh, an example of work by uh, several of our, our master's students a few years ago with Rory Glynn, um, whom you can just see walking into the frame here. Um, turn the volume down a little bit. It's just background music. This, as you can probably see, it's a robot uh, currently uh, during this video installed in the Pompidou Center. And uh, it's interacting with a group of people in the gallery. But the point of this robot is it's interacting not via any sort of normal conventional means of communication. It's not using text or words or, or any kind of language. It's using its body. It's uh, moving in certain ways, it's enacting a performance, but it's making gestures that uh, communicate something with the people around it. The interesting thing, of course, though, is that its body is also very different from our bodies. It's completely different in the way it's formed and the way it moves. But you can start to see something in the gestures, in the way it mimics people, in the way it responds to them, and so on. And you can see this as a kind of real conversation, in a sense. Uh, in fact, the, the dance performance you're about to see parts of here, where there are professional dancers interacting with it, the, the performance itself was choreographed as a kind of collaboration between the dancers and the robot. So they learn dance from it, imitating its movements. It learned to dance from them, imitating their movements, and to come up with a, a kind of, again, a conversation, a, a real conversation, even though they're not starting from the same starting points. They don't share the same um, representation or even the same view of the world, but still they can collaborate. 
And I think this is a good example of the sort of thing that ultimately is the source of creativity and design, that we all have different representations. We all have different ways of seeing the world and we all come together to make something that, uh, that works, hopefully. We won't watch the whole performance, but I think that's enough to get started. Uh, and to sort of put this into more of a, a theoretical framework, I want to do a, a brief kind of uh, history of artificial intelligence over most of the 20th century. And um, while I could start anywhere, I think this is a, a fairly good place to start. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, what we know as the Turing test. Alan Turing called it the imitation game. But just to describe it briefly, uh, it, this is test ostensibly for intelligence in a machine. And the idea is that you've got um, a, a room in which there's a computer and a person uh, inside the room and from an interrogator. Interrogator is marked C in this diagram. And they communicate with each other only via text. So there's no sort of subtle uh, hints of, of tones of voice or, or visual cues or anything. It's just distilled down to the basics of textual communication by a, a suitable sort of 1950 teletype sort of the idea here is that the, the computer and the person are both pretending to be human. And if the inter interrogator can't tell them apart, then the computer has successfully passed the Turing test. We have to judge it as intelligent because it behaves as an intelligent person would. Uh, it doesn't matter what's going on inside in this case. It's up to the interrogator to see based on what it produces, whether it's intelligent. And this is still in many ways a, a, a test for intelligence, it survived quite well. Um, but the whole process, this kind of process of, of speaking via text is, is the basis for much of artificial intelligence um, in the coming days after 1950. So if you look 15 years later at uh, Eliza, which I remember playing with uh, as a child, examples of this on computers that would be installed in science museums and so on. Um, this is an example of a text-based communication between a robot a psychiatrist, you might say, and uh, a patient. So the person is the patient and they're being asked questions by the computer. And there's a little snippet of conversation here where it starts out by the, the person saying, men are all alike. Eliza says, in what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here. He says, I'm depressed much of the time. I am sorry to hear you're depressed. Now, at this point, I won't read the whole thing, obviously, but you can sort of, you can realize that this makes some sense in the context of a psychiatrist conversation, but it's also starting to feel a bit stifled. And you can probably guess what's happening at this point in that it's repeating the words, made me come here, depressed, and so on. It's just rearranging them and then forming a response based on those words. It's manipulating the otherwise meaningless symbols that someone's typing in. And you could type in arbitrary words that don't mean anything, it would parrot them back to you. It doesn't actually have any understanding, but this was thought in some ways to be an example of artificial images. It was thought to be the kind of thing that we do. We manipulate the forms of symbols rather than actually understanding the meaning. Now, I say it's possible on the surface, but does it really tell us anything about the mind? There were examples or were theories of artificial intelligence, in particular what Newell and Simon, uh, Herbert Simon incidentally wrote, Sciences of the Artificial, about design. Uh, but Newell and Simon wrote, um, the, 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 they described the idea of a physical symbol system as being the essence of cognition that machines or natural cognitive systems are intelligent in virtue of their symbol manipulation properties. So in that sense, Eliza is getting at something that was thought to be at the core of intelligence. But this, this isn't enough for many philosophers. Uh, many people had um, arguments against this. In particular, one that's very popular and still talked about is John Searle's Chinese Room. And I mentioned this because it's, it's the same situation as the Turing test. But you're asked to imagine that instead of the machine inside the room, it's John Searle. And the Turing test is being performed in Chinese. Now, John Searle doesn't have any idea what Chinese symbols mean. So for him, they're meaningless squiggles, as he calls them, that come into the room. Um, Chinese interrogator on the outside writes down these symbols. John Searle inside the room doesn't understand them, but he does have at uh, he does have access to a kind of lookup table in which there are on the left and symbols on the right. And there are rules to manipulate those that he can follow. 
And then in doing so, he can produce some other symbols and send them out of the Chinese room um, and convince the interrogator, if that lookup table is sufficient, that he actually does understand and speak Chinese. Now, in this case, obviously, the lookup table is a computer program, and it's supposed to be written to such an extent that it's a program that passes the Bing test. Searle's argument, though, of course, is that if this is the case, he doesn't understand Chinese. There's no actual understanding going on there. The program is just an inert lookup table, so there can't be under any understanding there. If a program passes the Turing test, that's not enough for intelligence. There must be something else there. Now, he doesn't describe, doesn't explain exactly what it is. He just asserts that there must be more than just symbol manipulation to intelligence. So he's implementing a computer program without any understanding. Now, aside from that, there are other arguments that go well back even before what Turing proposed, um, related to some of other uh, some Turing's other uh, work is uh, what's known as Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which you may or may not have heard of. This is it stated as he did in 1931, but was was about the limits of formal systems. So mathematics or any kind of lookup table, any kind of Turing machine type system, any kind of formal system of computation, it describes the fact that there are true statements that can't be proved within that system. So there are limits to formal systems in terms of what they can do. Now, he did this by constructing uh, mathematically the equivalent statement, there exists no proof of this statement, which seems to be a kind of paradox. It's almost like um, this statement is false. It's that kind of level of paradox. But you can construct this in, in a mathematical system. You can construct this in any formal system that's worthy of doing the kind of computation that we do. So what it suggests, according to some arguments, is that there are limits to the kinds of things that computation can do. Now, the argument's a lot more more than that, but that's the basic gist of it. And overall, what this comes to is that the mind, creative thought, and so on, can't be merely a system of formal representations. Now, in these cases, that's asserted, but it isn't said exactly what else needs to occur here. And what I want to talk about today is my version of what I think is missing from these sorts of things. Now, that's representation in terms of symbols in a computer. But of course, the representations we use in architecture are also quite relevant. We're used to using representations all the time. We draw buildings using what we consider to be much more natural representations, I'm sure. We draw something that's analogous to the building itself that is a faithful model of the thing we want to build. But what we have to realize is that actually the representations even that we use have evolved over time. There are conventions that we use again, are, are with the systems that are agreed on. And they're really just formal tools for communication in the same sense. So if you look at the development of engineering drawing, which I've, I very briefly summarized over several centuries on this slide, uh, it starts out as a series of techniques for um, really quite embodied on-site tools for cutting stone and so on and develops over successive years um, till about the beginning of the, uh, the 19th century or so into something that is the standard plan and section that we're normally used to use today. And there's a whole series of conventions that go with this that we automatically know and don't even think about anymore. But conventions for describing what is in effect three-dimensional points and lines on a two-dimensional diagram. And there are a lot of rules that go along with this, rules that we take for granted, that are subtle, that we just agree to and don't even question anymore. Now, the fact that we don't question them I was, was brought uh, to my mind very clearly by an example a few years ago in a crit where it wasn't a crit for Lloyd Wright House, but I'm, I'm showing you that these drawings of the, uh, the Affleck House by Frank Lloyd Wright to describe the sort of thing that I saw pinned up on, uh, on a wall. And it was a plan and section very much like this of a building that the student was designing. And they were describing it in three dimensions, describing it room by room. And I was sitting trying to make sense of it three-dimensionally, as, as you might in this situation, and I just couldn't. Now, if you look carefully at this, I don't know if anyone's been looking at it and can understand what's going on here, but if you try to make sense of the spaces in here, the same sort of problem arises. And the problem is that if you look at these and you project downward from the plan to the section, which is normally how we read these things, they don't line up. 
So the walls that appear in the top drawing are not in the same place horizontally on the same axis as the one in the bottom drawing. And this is what the student had done. Now, the difference here, I think, is because I'm a different generation. I learned to draw these things by, by rigorously projecting manually in drafting uh, over years and years, my plans and sections from one to the next. I cannot even conceive of a plan and section that don't line up in the way that they're supposed to. But presumably the student who had uh, most of their career had drawn uh, a three-dimensional CAD model, sliced it, taken the views and then composed them on the page, thinks of the model in an entirely different way. These are just views that can be composed on a page in the way that I see fit. And of course, because of the, just because of the borders, in this case, the borders of the, um, where the site is cut off are actually aligned to the rightmost edge of the drawing above. This is where it ends up on the page. Now, to me, I just couldn't see it, but to that student, presumably they didn't quite understand my difficulty. Um, and it did to them that the drawings had to be aligned. So it's a completely different way of thinking about representations. Now that's a subtlety but we all have different ways of thinking about our representations. And I don't wanna say one way is more correct than the other, but they're valid depending on your, your, uh, your point of view. Now the same of course is true when we get into something a little bit more complex, uh, like a parametric model, which again, we think is representing not just the geometry of the thing, but the underlying structure and all the relationships between the parts, that this is conveying somehow the essence of the thing we're, we're, uh, we're constructing. But it's really important to understand that this too can change. And I'll give you an example of the sort of thing that I think summarizes really the process of creative design in a really clear way. And that's a project by, um, by Anthony Gormley. I worked on, on this project for Anthony Gormley about 15 years ago, um, part of a series of projects. And, and this series of sculptures were a series of, of expansion pieces that were describing the space around the body. And in the slide, you can just see, I think, the head toward the lower right and the feet uh, up toward the, uh, the upper left side of the frame. And there are a series of rods that stretch out from the surface of the body, about 50 or 60 centimeters in this case. There are a whole series of these. Some had longer rods, some had shorter, some were denser, some were more sparse. But the idea behind all of them is that they're conveying that space around the body. Now, it's a really complex piece of geometry here. If you look at, um, here's the studio. If you look at uh, a series of these, you can imagine this takes months of labor for a person to weld each of these rods together. So it's really important to understand when you're beginning what sort of geometry you're going for, because if you, you end up coming back to where you start and the rods don't uh, end up in the right place, you realize you made a mistake. It's a lot of work to uh, just, just do it intuitively. So my role came in in trying to figure out what the, what the rules are essentially. There's obviously some order here, but the question is what exactly are the, how would you describe the algorithm so that we can understand exactly what the tree is rather than just intuiting it. So you can see the example there. Um, if we look more carefully at how this is put together, you can see there's a series of steps. Um, and this again was done manually at first. You can see the the surface of the body is covered by these small rods that make up these hexagons, these pentagons, these sort of open poly gosh, that describes the surface of the body. And then from each of the vertices, you can see there's a rod that extends outwards. Again, these are 50 or 60 centimeters, all uniform size to describe the surface of the body. And then on the outside, in you can just about see probably in the third image, on the outside, the ends of those rods also end the same kind of open polygon structure. So these open pentagons and hexagons, these polygons around the outside, just much bigger. So that's the kind of process. And you're right, um, it, you know, if, if we were live, I'd ask maybe for someone to describe what they thought the algorithm was. Um, I, I've generally asked students this when I've presented it, and uh, the, the first answer tends to be exactly what I thought the algorithm was, was that each of these rods would be set based on the normal of the skin of the body at that particular point. So obviously with any, with any curved surface, there is one line that is perpendicular to the surface at that point. And if you extend it outwards, you can extend it outward 50, 60 centimeters, cut it off, and then you've got the same kind of geometry, but it, it extruded outwards. So it's, it's an offset essentially, 50 or 60 centimeters from the surface of the body. Very standard sort of CAD move in 3D and the kind of thing that you could set for this sort of thing. 
So that was the first example of what we said uh, the algorithm would be. And we use that to create other examples um, to inform the well of the rods. But we quickly found that it didn't work quite as well as we thought. So particularly, you can see here, between the legs, or between the arm and the, and the torso, between the head and the neck, where the, rod, where the surfaces are less than 50 or 60 centimeters apart, and the rods actually extend out and then intersect one another in space. What do you do about that? Well, you can cut them off, of course, but they don't necessarily touch. So what you can see here is a sort of intermediate stage where we said, well, actually, we can start to move the surface normals. We can either, we can either fudge a little bit by, by bending the rods, or we can actually massage the points around. We can optimize the points on either leg so that they're in the right place where the rods will meet. And that will give us what we want. But it turns out that you might have more points on one leg than the other. And topologically, th there's no way to do this. So there were problems. Now, aside from this, another thing that intuitively we knew must exist was that you can see the, the, the areas where the rods are actually touching one another. You can imagine this kind of forms a kind of curved plane, curved surface as well. And it should have the same kind of open polygon structure. That was intuitive in the way we thought about this thing. The same kind of open and gone structure should exist in these planes between the legs and between the arm and the torso and so on. We look something like this. And the surface normals just don't give you that. There's no way really in the end to reconcile it. So we worked at that for a bit and then it turns out that that's not the algorithm that describes this intuitive geometry. It turns out it's something radically different, completely different. And that's a Voronoi diagram. So again, Voronoi diagrams, quite popular, totally different structure though, uh, just a brief there's a series of points here, and a Voronoi diagram is the cells that enclose the space that's closer to each of those points than to any other point. So these red lines bisect any two neighboring points. Now, this is what it looks like in two dimensions, but you can draw it in three dimensions as well. And if you draw a Voronoi diagram in three dimensions, you get these three dimensional cells. If the points in question are the points on the surface of the body, Body. then those cells form, as you can see here, a kind of open polygon structure on the surface of the body, but they also extend outwards into space. And if you cut them off at 50 or 60 centimeter, you get the structure that we were looking for. Now you get everything. You don't get just the internal polygons, but you get the internal polygons, you get the points, you get the, the rods extending upwards and you get the outer surface and you get those nice open polygon meshes between the legs and the arm and the torso and everything. So it gives thing from one simple algorithm. And more than that, the algorithm itself is actually describing space rather than individual lines. So it's much closer to the original intuition, which is to describe the space around the body. And of course, it can be applied to any pose and used for, for several different iterations of that series of sculptures. So it really refined the idea. But the reason I'm showing it is that it's part of a process of working from surface normals to Voronoi is an example of the kind of creative leap that you see all the time in any kind of design process. But the way it seems to happen, and I think this illustration is good, is that we're working back and forth between instances of real things in, in the world, sketch models, drawings, um, actual uh, welding rods together and so on, which are real instances of the thing. And the other side of the thing, which is the abstract rules, the idea of surface normals, the algorithm for that, the Voronoi algorithm. And we switch back and forth. So we start with the sketch model, and that makes us realize, looking at that, that there's some surface normals involved. From surface normals, we make another iteration, realize the rods don't meet, and then we come up with this other thing, this Voronoi diagram. Now, in both cases, there are different ideas about what design is. On the left, all of the physical things, these are the things we typically think of when we're thinking about sketching and design. This is what designers, we, we classically, um, this is the output that we, we produce sketches and models and final things in the end. If we think about what computational designers do, parametric, generative, computational programmers, all, all of the things that we do um, in, in specifying the rules, the other side of things. Now, neither one of them describes design. It's about moving back and forth. And particularly, the only way you can get from surface normals to Voronoi, there's no mapping of one concept onto the other. They're completely different. So the only way that you can get from the idea of surface normals to the idea of the Voronoi diagram is via the examples in the real world. Do something, see what's wrong with it in some cases, but then to abstract from that a completely different set of rules. And that's what the creative leap can send.
Now, going from rules to instances is what machines are generally very good at. That's typically what we, we think of when we think of computational design. We've got some rules and we implement them. A parametric model will produce the geometry that we can then use to, uh, to make an instance of the thing. But typically going the other way, um, this is the thing that we typically use human intuition for. So in this case, I want to propose that um, AI, if it's going to be used in design, one of the important things it has to do is to be able to go from instances to rules, to do what our intuition normally does. And in seeing the world in a certain way, it's effectively creating something. So I'm going to attack this from three different points of view. Uh, the first is over the rest of the lecture. The first is metaphysical, and that's just to understand what I mean when I say the machine can have concepts. That, um, that seems it's a, a bit of a strange leap. We're, we're not, um, you know, we're used to concepts as being things that are in our brains rather than machines. Um, the second is practical. How does this help design? How do we use it? And the third, which is probably the most important, is why this is important and relevant to us. Why should we use computers? and AI in design. So metaphysically, to start with, we've got these two things on either side. We've got this on one side, real physical things, sketch models and so on. And on the other side, we've got these products of the mind, these abstract surface normals, Voronoi diagrams, things that we think about. Now, this seems to be a very dualist kind of proposition, um, philosophically speaking, metaphysically speaking, that there are two different types of things. Now, I don't personally ascribe to dualism. Uh, and I think that in the context of AI, where we're thinking about making machines actually think, it doesn't really make any sense. So how do we reconcile these two things? I wanna go through a few models that I think help a little bit anyway, uh, that tackle the same kind of idea of the relationship between our abstract thoughts of the world and the world itself. And, and the first is the, the three worlds model that Karl Popper um, described. And that there are three different ways of, of viewing the world, three different worlds in effect. Um, when I say worlds, you have to think of this as more of a metaphor because the second and third world, we're not actually saying how it, it really exists, but what they describe um, in terms of the relationship between concepts and reality. And the first world is reality. It's physical bodies. The second world being our subjective experiences of those things in the, in the real world, our own concepts of what we see, what we experience, um, and what we know to be true. Uh, and these are individual. I have mine, you have yours. They're different by nature because we have our own private experiences and we can't actually access one another's directly. So the second world is individual. Uh, and then the third world is what we might call the shared or what Popper called objective knowledge, which is the shared products of the mind. So he gives examples of Shakespeare's Hamlet, the American constitution, Newton's theory of gravity, the English language. These are all seem to exist objectively Yet we all understand them only through our, our own second world, individual private experiences of them. And they only exist, they don't exist in the physical world in the same sense as real objects. They exist only as products of the mind that are shared. So what, what's the relationship here? Well, there are different takes on this. So someone like Roger Penrose, who describes to a very similar sort of model, thinks that this third world, this world of shared knowledge is platonic. In a way, it exists outside of our experience of that. Um, now, Popper wouldn't ascribe to that. Uh, it doesn't exist necessarily in itself, aside from our, our own mental world. But what's interesting about Penrose's model is this kind of circular relationship or this triangular relationship between the two. Because in effect, the physical world is what uh, gives us our, our mental understanding. We can only understand things by virtue of experiencing things in the, in the physical, the real world. Uh, yet the mental world is something that informs what that platonic mathematical world is. He's interested in mathematics, where Popper is interested more in science and our understanding of things, but also say Shakespeare and, uh, and politics and so on. These are products that are derived from individual mental worlds that, that become part of shared knowledge. And of course, uh, in Penrose's view, because he's thinking more about mathematics, the physical world obeys those laws of mathematics. So somehow that mathematical world is informing the physical world. And it's this circular exchange that I think is really relevant in the connection between these worlds, because it's very similar 
to a psychological model or a systems model by Csikszentmihalyi. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi um, has a systems model of creativity in terms of the relationship between not what he calls three different worlds, but the, the individual person, the field of other people who constitute judges uh, of their creative work and the domain, which is other creative works. So in the context of architecture, let's say the person is an individual architect who from their own mind creates a design for a building, submits it to the field. The field might be clients, might be architecture critics, might be the general public, people out there that are worthy to judge that particular thing. And if they judge it as worthy, in this case, maybe they decide to build it, it enters the domain, which is the, the shared repository of all knowledge of that particular field. So in this case, architecture. And things in the domain, so buildings that are built, then inform what the individual person can design next. These are precedents. Architects might be inspired by them. They might look to them for examples and so on. And it's this circular relationship that drives the creative process. And of course, domain changes, that changes what an individual person can create. They submit it to the field, the field decides it goes into the domain and so on. And it goes around its circular way to drive the overall process. For now, this is completely analogous in, in many ways to the same idea of the three worlds where we've got the, the domain, the first world of real things, with the person who experiences that individually and then we've got the collective knowledge of the field and it goes circularly. Now, the thing is though, that we can't see that collective knowledge directly. We can only experience it via the physical world. Just as we can't go from one idea, this, this idea of surface normals to the idea of uh, the, 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 um, the Voronoi diagram directly. We can only go via the physical world. And that's exactly the sort of thing that happens. And I think the computer can do the same thing. So when I talk about defining what a concept is, the question is how does the computer actually see the world? So we're talking about the relationship here between the physical world and the mental world. What does the computer do to allow it to form a concept of physical reality? Um, now to do this, I'm gonna go back to the, the history of CAD and talk about the way it was traditionally done, which is to say, um, classically in artificial intelligence and in CAD, we say, well, here's a symbol for something that represents something in the world. And that's gonna be given. We're gonna have a line or a circle or a, an eye beam or something that's given. It's a thing that we manipulate in the computer, but it's already there. Um, now this goes right back to the beginning of CAD. I'll say Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad is the first example of CAD back in the early 60s. But that was developed at MIT around the same time as a lot of these ideas of artificial intelligence. Also in the context of linguistics and uh, a knock-on effect onto AI, Noam Chomsky's idea of generative grammar, so rules, formals for producing language. Uh, George Steine took that idea and developed formal rules for shape grammars. These are all essentially symbolic approaches, symbol manipulation approaches, manipulation of representations that are given in design. Now, of course, we've moved on since then. You know, we're 60 years, 70 years later, um, 60 years later uh, in CAD, and we've got more sophisticated tools. Got an example of generative components circa about 10 years ago on the right there. It looks very different, but Underneath it all, it's the same thing. It's still manipulating these symbolic representations. And it does basically the same thing that Sketchpad did. Because we start with these representations and we put them together. And in fact, this is, uh, this is explicit in generative components, for instance, where the relationship between all of the parametric components is known as the symbolic model. It's the thing you create. So you're not creating the thing itself. You're not creating even the geometry, you're creating these series of relationships by putting together these symbolic relationships. Now, we do have alternate ways of dealing with computation though, things that are different now. So Moore's law means we have computers that are 10 billion times faster. We've got big data now, we've got vastly more amounts of data that we can process than we had 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And we've got new algorithms to do so. I've got AlphaGo as an example, because we've got algorithms now that use those techniques to be competitive with humans that do things that, that are more or less the same kind of output that uh, our minds do, that pass some version of the Turing test, let's say. 
but they do it not by being given those representations, but by creating the representations themselves. Um, I've called the messy data approaches because they tend to work from data toward representations. Uh, and this is an example of the sort of thing. This is a, a plant room, a video of a plant room. Um, but as you can see it, you, you we're going through and you can see your mind is making uh, representations here of, of tanks and stairs and, and floors, surfaces, cylinders, all sorts of things that make sense geometrically. These are all representations that are being made by our mind. But what this is, is only a rendering of individual points floating in space, completely, it's a laser scan. So you've just got a series of points that aren't connected in any way, and our brains are making the representations ad hoc, on the fly, as we go, as we view this thing. We're doing it over and over and over again, they're constantly doing so. That's what our brains are good at. They're not starting with those representations, they're making them after the fact. And to some extent, a computer can do the same sort of thing, even with complex things that are out there in the world. So for example, I've got a series of cities here, city graphs, city maps of streets, just of the streets. But each graph that you might choose, the nodes connected together, will have what we call a, a graph spectrum. So these are the, the ordered set of eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of the graph. And every individual graph, if it changes its topology, will have a different spectrum. And the differences between those spectra can be measured in a high dimensional space to gauge the differences between cities. So if you change a few streets in London a little bit, that spectrum will change a lot. If you change a lot of those streets, it'll be very different. And the differences between the topology of cities can be measured in that high dimensional space. Now, when we do that, we can do that for whole cities, we can do it for local neighborhoods. Um, and as an example of, of local neighborhoods, these are the, the principal components of the differences between neighborhoods in London on the left and Seattle on the right. So these are just local graphs around individual streets. So 200 local streets around each one. And they differ over the course of the city. But you can see in London, um, areas that are similar topologically and, and formally uh, have the same sort of color. I've colored them here by their position in respect to the principal components. And areas that look similar, particularly in the center of London, you can see there, there are recognizable neighborhoods that look similar to one another, and they're colored in uh, a similar way. And then around the outskirts, it changes a little bit, and you've got suburban neighborhoods that are similar to one another, and they're colored in a different color. But that color changes depending on its, uh, its form. Now, the computer is able to see this basically just by analyzing the differences in those subgraphs. Um, Seattle is on the right, and it's got a different sort of configuration. But if we look at the two, if we look at all of the streets within this high dimensional space, this is reduced down to two dimensions now. We'd have a, a 200 dimensional space because we've got 200 dimensions for, for each street. We've got 200 uh, uh, entries in the, uh, the spectrum. But if you look at all the London streets, which I've shown in blue, and all the Seattle streets, which I've shown in red, you can see they take two different regions of that space, purely based on their, their form or properties, their geometry. And in most cases, there's virtually no overlap. So 90% of the streets in London look different from 90% of the streets in Seattle. And the computer is able, without any kind of other instruction, it's able to say, well, with a 90% accuracy, this street is a sort of London street, and this street is a sort of Seattle street. They just look different inherently. It's able to see those sorts of things. So we can quantify these characteristic local, form local morphologies of each city as regions in that space. And we can measure the differences between them. Uh, now that works at a bigger scale too. This is some more recent work by Tassos Verudis, who's looking at the, the entire UK street network and doing basically the same thing. He's here clustered it into four different, uh, different regions based on their similarity. And it picks out recognizable differences. So you can see the cities on one hand picked out in one color, the suburbs in another color, the, uh, the arable farmland in an, and the sort of the, the unfarmed wilderness, you might say, in a fourth color. And these correspond almost exactly to the areas, if you, if you look at the land use maps for the UK, these correspond almost exactly to those regions. It's able to pick them up again, purely based on the street morphology. So this is evident to the computer without any kind of uh, uh, other um, labeling. It doesn't necessarily know what farmland is, but it's able to recognize it. And we can do this to 
as the largest count. You can do the whole graph of a city and you can compare cities with one another. So in this case, this is cities all around uh, the world, 150 cities, um, and the computer is able to classify them to tell whether they're in, say, Europe versus North America versus South America versus Asia. And it's able to classify them with about 75 to 85% accuracy. So again, just looking at how similar it is to other cities, it's able to say, well, yes, this is similar to those other cities. It's probably in that region of the world. Again, doesn't know anything about the city other than its form, but it's able to do this. Now, we can do this, we can, we can give it a concept let's say, so that the concept we've got here is just this region of space, the similarity of the data to all of the other data or the difference of that data to other data. But how can we be so sure that this is actually giving us something real? That This isn't just arbitrary. This is falling out of the data and showing us some misleading picture. How can we know that this is giving us something close to what, we, what, um, what Penrose considers to be that ideal platonic third world or Popper just considers to be this sort of intersubjective third world? Well, we can look at the data and we can see that actually uniformly, sometimes the same pattern falls out regardless of what the inputs are. So this example is a very similar one at a much smaller scale by Anna Lascari uh, quite a few years ago, um, about 13 years ago, I think. And she was looking at the differences between neighborhoods in Athens and London, purely based on the footprints of the buildings. And uh, obviously, when you walk through a neighborhood, you sense that there's a difference architecturally between one neighborhood and the next. The buildings look different, but it's often very difficult to specifically say what those differences are in a formal way, in the way that you could actually encode into a computer program or even to describe exactly to someone else what the differences are between one neighborhood and the next. Take, you could write, you could write a whole book on it uh, and you still wouldn't get there. But intuitively, we're able to assess these differences, We know them as we walk through the city. So the question is whether without being instructed, without having to write and read a book on it, can the computer make the same kind of decisions or, or distinctions as we would? Can it recognize the difference in form? And it turns out using uh, a series of, of different dimensions of analysis that it can. So uh, in this case, there were 13 different dimensions you can see here everything from machine vision type processes like looking at the fractal dimension to looking at, at the, uh, the connectivity of the graph or looking at the internal spaces of the courtyards, classifying um, different measures rather than classifying, measuring different uh, quantities of those. But again, more or less arbitrarily chosen, uh, 13 different dimensions. And it turns out that if you look then at the differences between them, buildings that have a similar form, we would judge aesthetically to be similar, or judge uh, based on the plan to be similar, do have similar dimensions in each of these categories. Not in all of them, but if you look at them as a whole uh, and you take, say, a subset of those, they tend to easily classify the cities uh, or rather the neighborhoods within Athens as distinct areas of space and the neighborhoods of Athens versus London, again, as distinct areas of space. So they look different based on those individual data points. Now, the thing is, you can take different subsets of those. So instead of saying, well, we have to have all of the, the data points and you and I have to agree on what our dimensions are to have this same point of view, because ultimately that's arbitrary and it's based on the kind of uh, inputs that we have. It turns out if you take a lot of different points of view, and I'm just saying take arbitrary sets of each of these dimensions, call them different points of view and see how these align it turns out that you don't have to have the same input dimensions. You don't have to have the same um, point of view to agree on what the neighborhoods are. The only thing that matters is that you have a sufficient quantity of them. So it turns out that if you look, this diagram on the right, slightly difficult to read, but what it is, is describing as you add the number of attributes, as you take more and more of them, what does that do to the overall error. Now, the one on the right, of course, uh, the one on the left, rather, if you have more dimensions to do your classification in, um, that means that you can make a better classification. But the one on the right is actually just showing what naturally falls out in a standard number of dimensions if you increase the attribute. So we've got, say, anywhere from zero, or rather from one to 13 different dimensions. Um, as we add, as we take more of them, um, and then we compress the space and, and do our classification within that compressed space, a standard 
dimensions, the more attributes we have, the better our classification is. And the more it will overlap with anyone else who's made that classification. So it seems it doesn't matter. The, the ones on the, again, the, the drawing, the, um, I can't point to it very well, but you can see the randomly distributed data, the data that is just made up at random in which there are no underlying patterns there doesn't improve as you add dimensions. If there's something there, the difference, the real differences between those neighborhoods, it does improve over time as you add more attributes. So it suggests that there is something real being picked up here, but it also suggests that if you and I come up with a, a judgment even though we have different attributes that we're measuring or different ways of seeing the, the, the world, we will still tend to agree as long as we have sufficient, um, uh, sum sufficient attributes that we're measuring. So when those sets are large. Now, the next question is how do we design with it? So this goes from seeing the world, from the computer developing a concept to actually changing it. How do we actually operate with this? Because of course, computers are very good at going from rules to instances, but that's typically when the rules are highly structured, when we write some mode explicitly and say, these are the sets of rules. The kinds of things I'm talking about here, these ideas of, of measuring in a parameter space tend to be much more real valued and, uh, and less uh, clearly rule-based. How do they actually create instances in the world? Well, one way, and there's several ways of doing it, but one way is that we combine it with something a little bit more standard like optimization. Now in optimization, general idea of what we're doing is that we've got some sort of parameter space, let's say, and we can search a range of possible designs and we're looking for something that is already well-defined. So we want uh, say the lowest cost or we want the, the stiffest truss or something. And that stiffness can be measured on some sort of axis that is well-defined, that is platonic, let's say, that is agreed upon in advance by lots of people who set, or by lots of people, or by the one person who's designing it. But it's explicitly defined in the sense of optimization, that we define what our fitness objective is. And then we can climb to the top of the landscape, and we can find the thing we're looking for. Now, in the kinds of situations that I'm talking about, we may not be able to agree. Uh, and so what we instead is derive something from the data itself by defining an archetype, which is a region of that space. So when I talk about the difference in the region of space, the streets in London versus the streets in Seattle, let's say, we might define London as that region of the space in the center of the London streets versus Seattle, which is on the other side. And once we have this archetype, this idea of what London is, we could optimize other street configurations to match that. Now it might not be London, it might be any kind of um, data that you know to be the sort of thing that you're looking for. But once we've done that, we can measure the distance of any new design from that archetype and we can assess how good it is and we can optimize toward that. So as one example, I'll show you um, an example of uh, material optimization here, which goes back quite a way. Again, this is this goes back about 15 years, some of this research. Um, but uh, we've got, let's say, uh, the chair on the right, an object that you'd like to build in which you want to optimize the structure to have a certain set of properties. But those properties are very complex and you can't necessarily define them. Now, in this case, we're, we're dealing with something that is going to have a very complex internal structure. The model for this is something like wood or bone, which is organic and has a complex cellular structure that has properties that are really useful. Uh, what we want to do is make a man-made version of this, of course, which is very complex. Now, what we could do is go through an optimization process where we slowly climb that hill up to the very top. Uh, and we have this iterative process where in this case, we've got a kind of cellular structure, as you can see, and we can optimize based on the local load conditions of that particular object. We can optimize the, the bit of, of structure. This is produced by uh, laser sintering incidentally. So we can optimize the struts, their angle and their thickness and so on to, uh, to, to best respond to that local load. And then we move somewhere else and that loading conditions are a little bit different. And we optimize it to this topology optimization type of approach and, uh, and make every cell slightly different to best carry that load throughout the object. If we do that, that's a, a long involved optimization procedure, which I've diagrammed on the left here within the gray box 
of the those five or so different elements in the flowchart, which which involves setting the um, the jury, evaluating the structure using the finite element method in this case, um, evaluating seeing whether it is improving, is it getting any stiffer? Uh, if it is, then keep going in that direction. If it's not, then move in a different direction to climb hill. But there's a lot going on here. It takes a lot of computational effort, the finite element method, to compute the geometry. And it takes a lot of effort to do this repeatedly to optimize each of these individual nodes. And there might be means of them in a structure. So instead of that, we can take this whole process and if a little bit of data, make some examples and test them out, we can use that data to train up what I've drawn as a network here. In fact, what we usually use is a support vector machine, but the, the idea is very similar. We, we can train it so that you can go from the local load condition to the ideal optimized structure, and then it can produce them very, very fast. So something like 70,000 times faster um, than optimization. Uh, here's an example uh, from, from quite a few years ago with uh, Siavash Harun Madavi. Um, which is a very small cantilever example. And now that's the kind of scale we're dealing with in terms of these tiny cells. So you can imagine there are many, many hundreds of thousands or millions even in any kind of uh, reasonably sized thing. But if you look at the difference between a uniform structure, which in simulation, I've got a, a standard load on both of these and it deflects, what is that? 3.6 units in this simulation. On the right, same amount of material, same load, and you can barely see that move. It's something like 70 times stiffer. Um, so you can barely, I don't know if you can see if you saw that at all. It, it almost doesn't move at all. So, so this is much, much stiffer, but it's also much, much faster in terms of producing it than optimization would be. Now, you can go from this, that stiffness, which is very well defined. Uh, there are other much more complex properties. Uh, so for instance, Poisson's ratio. Um, this is Surat Babu's work here with, with composite structures. And Poisson's ratio, if you're familiar with it, if you take a material and you compress it in this direction, normally it'll expand in that direction. The ratio of that is the Poisson's ratio. Now, for most materials, uh, it'll expand. Um, for some materials, like cork, you can compress it, and it, it doesn't expand. Um, cork is very good for sticking in wine bottles for that reason. Uh, but some materials, auxetic materials, if I compress them in this direction, they actually compress in that direction as well. And that's got a negative Poisson's ratio. Now, negotiating these Poisson's ratio, it's a factor. Um, it could be of material, but it could also be of the, of the microstructural organization. So just like stiffness, you can optimize things to have certain Poisson's ratio. And you can do exactly the same process whereby collecting data on these things and the whole construction process, the composite structure, which makes it more difficult, the, the actual fabrication by the machine, all of this data can go in via the samples into something that's trained to produce things of variable Poisson's ratio or other material properties that might be very complex and we might wish. Now, why is this important? I think this is the, the, the crucial bit of the, uh, the talk. If we're going to have computers essentially operating as colleagues, what do they contribute? If they're going to take uh, make concepts of the things they see rather than being by us, and they're going to make suggestions in the design process um, rather than being used as tools, which is essentially what we're getting at here. What does it contribute? Why use a computer rather than not? And the point here, I think, is that um, they are effectively operating intuitively. But intuition, of course, plays a huge role in our design. It deals with a lot of complexity, possibly more than we know. We probably don't acknowledge consciously all of the uh, the complexity that's wrapped up in all the precedents that we understand, all our experience of the world, and so on. If a computer is going to do that, then what does it do that we can't do? Now, our intuition, unfortunately, is limited by our scale, our senses, all of the things that we've evolved to be able to do, all of the, the sort of um, the normal things that are at our sort of scale, uh, both in time and space, that we're used to dealing with. But the machine is able to perceive things that are outside of that scale, that are possibly larger, smaller, more complex than we're used to dealing with. Now, we are designing things that are of, of vastly uh, larger scales than we've evolved to deal with. And we're dealing with things at a level of complexity that we can't understand. So design problems are getting larger, more complex than they ever have. And to deal with these kinds of complexities, that's where the kind of intuition that possibly if we can develop in a computer 
that's where it can come in because it can handle things that we're just not evolved to do. So we're talking about matching flexibility here, eventually. Um, and the project that I think is, is a fun project to start with is this project by Dave Deduca a few years ago, who made these two faces, which can take on different facial expressions, uh, fairly rudimentary faces, abstract ones, but they're clearly uh, readable by us as facial expressions. And what they do essentially is they have no knowledge of what a happy face means, what a sad face means. They have to evolve this knowledge over time, and they do it by looking at other people. Now, they're not copying other people's expressions, and they have no idea what their own expressions look like. The only thing they can go on is whether they're attracting people to engage with them and pay attention to them. That's their only goal in this. Uh, and it turns out over time, they evolve ways, just like the robot I showed you at the beginning, even though they have a completely different conception of, of the world, they evolve ways of engaging with people. And it turns out yeah, quite um, quite nicely from the data, it seems that they engage um, small children by smiling at them, making happy faces, and they engage adults more by scowling and making sort of uh, grumpy faces and so on. This seems to be more engaging. But they evolve these ways, again, of communicating using a totally different concept of, uh, of what the world is and what expressions mean but it does effectively uh, it works now when we think about our idea of, of computation and particularly the idea of representing things in CAD and BIM in particular the idea is that we want a better and better representation we try to get more and more information into our model so that we can precisely represent the world all the complexities of the building the idea is that if we can get more of that information there accessible in that bim model we'll be able to manipulate it and that will be better for our design now it turns out though that in practice often we don't need the same information. So the architect who's designing the building might need some information and the quantity surveyor might need some other information and the, the structural engineer might see, need some different information. And all of these eventually have to go into a building, but the forms in which they individually manipulate them might be different and they might need to access that information in different ways. So th this reminds me of a um, this, this computational approach of going for better and better representations. It reminds me very much of this uh, Borges story on rigor and science, which uh, you may have read before, which is about a very short story, paragraph or so, about a uh, college of cartographers who evolve uh, a more and more precise science of cartography. And they build bigger and bigger maps of the empire that were the same size as the empire eventually. Uh, the biggest map is, is actually a one-to-one -one map. And that becomes a useless map because of course it doesn't tell you anything that is useful for your own use of the map. It's just the empire. And eventually cartography becomes abandoned because it's a completely useless science. This is the kind of trajectory that we're on if we're trying to make the model a more and more accurate representation, You know, a digital twin that encompasses everything uh, that we need in, in our real thing. We need something that is more agile and can change often. Um, so one of, the, one of the examples I think of this, uh, and this goes back to, um, a, an idea of a, a proposition about the extended mind by Andy Clark and David Chalmers. This is Chalmers, Chalmers uh, 20, 22 years ago, when they proposed the idea that the mind cognition extends outside of the head and into other things in the world. Our phones, for instance, as we're all familiar with now, notebooks, other kinds of representations that are outside of our head. And that those are actually engaged in cognition. And they give the example of Otto. This is a, a sort of thought experiment. Otto is an Alzheimer's patient who lives in Manhattan. And uh, whenever he needs to remember something, he writes it down in his notebook. So he's got instructions. If he needs to go to the Museum of Modern Art, for instance, he looks up the MoMA in his notebook and uh, that tells him where it is. So he can function like uh, a, a human being with normal memory, even though everything is outside of his head and in this book. Um, it's his memory because it's his book, but um, it's uh, essentially an extended mind. Now, the difference here, I think, is if you think about the kind of representation that is, that it doesn't seem to do the sorts of things that representations in our head do. It seems to be much more fixed. Um, if you think about it, if, uh, if he uh, has this random access sort of memory where he has to look up the MoMA, well, if he goes to the MoMA and he he has a nice uh, crab cake sandwich, the monkey bar around the corner, for instance, uh, and he notes that down, it, it'll change over time. Eventually, the, this book will become fuller and fuller. But if he needs to access that memory, 
other than, you know, if, just because he's in the area, not because he's going to the MoMA, he won't be able to find it. So it won't function the way that our memory does, where we associate things. Our memories, any change to our memory will allow us to see the world in a completely different way. It changes the way we see the world. And that's absolutely relevant. Um, here, it only operates by a, a sort of random access approach. So if he's looking for that thing and it's in the right place in his notebook, then it will change his actions. But it doesn't change his experience of everything uh, immediately, which is what our arm does. Now, if you think about a project, borrowing this slide from Dimitri Stefanescu, whose work I'll show you in just a second, every project we might have has a whole series of stakeholders that have different points of view and different objectives about that project. Now, they all have completely different ways of seeing it. They all have to be reconciled. But the thing is that the, all of their individual ways of seeing don't have to be reconciled in totality. They just all have to be met by that particular project. And there's a big difference here because it's that real thing in reality that just has to satisfy all of those different ways of seeing the world. But it may be that the different ways of seeing the world are somewhat incompatible. If they're incompatible in ways that don't apply to the project, that's absolutely fine. It's only that that project has to satisfy all the goals as much as possible. So if we think about the kinds of representations that we have in Otto's notebook or in our, our standard symbolic representations in computers, um, these don't help us think if it's just meaningless symbol manipulation. So what sort of thing can? I've got another example of a Borges story, which I think describes this direction better than the other one, which is uh, not a story, a brief article about a certain encyclopedia, Chinese encyclopedia, the Heavenly Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge. And it divides animals into a, a rather odd seeming classification. A, those belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed ones, C, those that are trained, D, suckling pigs, E, mermaids, F, fabulous ones, G, stray dogs, uh, H, those are included in this classification, and so on. And this seems to us, you know, with our Linnaean logical classifications of, you know, the Latin uh, genus, species, and so on that we're used to, this seems like an odd classification. It's very different, obviously. Uh, it seems useless to us, but the point is that it seems that it must have been useful to somebody else. And that's the point, that every point of view um, has a different classification that makes most sense to them. And they just have to work together on this thing they have to provide. So another way of working, other than the, the traditional approach, this is where I was getting to with uh, Dimitri's slide. So um, Dimitri Stefanescu developed uh, this software, Speckle, which is essentially, uh, instead of saying, well, we have to agree to a standard, an overall CAD standard, and everybody has to submit to it, and everyone has to enter their information for the BIM model in exactly the same way. The idea instead is that you create a platform by which different people, different stakeholders, different um, offices with different CAD standards, different softwares that do different things, can transfer only the information that's relevant and to negotiate between one another to, to develop this connection. So rather than submit to the single standard, you have lots of different representations that all work together. Now, the complexity that we're dealing with, of course, I mentioned scale. Uh, we want to interpret things that are much larger than us. So I'm just going to show a few examples. I see the time is getting, getting close to the end here. So I'm gonna go through a few examples about how we can access things that are well beyond our intuition. One of them being space syntax, which is I'm a member of space syntax lab at the Bartlett. And much of what we do is to look at the configuration at, at methods for um, analyzing space. One of them is, as you can see here, a centrality analysis in this case, a, a centrality analysis of the streets in London, each of them colored up by how central they are within the network. And of course, this corresponds very closely to the kind of use you get. So the number of people walking or driving on each of the spaces is, uh, is given by how central it is within the network. And if you look a little bit closer, this is a different kind of centrality analysis, betweenness rather than closest centrality, if you're interested, at a different scale. And it shows up, you can see there are red spots corresponding to the bits of highest centrality that correspond in all cases to the centers of neighborhoods that we would name as neighborhood centers that we define. These are the areas where the, the local high street shops are and so on. And you can pick these out reliably in pretty much any city. To give another example of that, uh, here's one in, in Beijing. Um, very quickly, you can see at one level, 
of analysis, one radius, you can see what it picks out are these major routes through the city. And um, this is what that street looks at, but one of the high centrality points within the city. And this is a major through route. A lot of traffic. There might be a train station nearby. I can't remember. But, but this is a highly trafficked route. And if you change the scale of analysis, you get something like this. And you get these hot spots sort of scattered out. This is a 500 meters catchment. So you get these sort of hot spots every 500 meters or so. And what these correspond to are completely different. Uh, this is the, the center of the local shops, the local market where people would come within about half a kilometer to buy their groceries and so on. But you can pick these out purely based based on the, the configuration, the geometry of the streets. Now, we can go way outside our normal level of intuition, as I said, because we can do the same thing at the international level. And you can see if we do the same sort of analysis here, this is a centrality analysis of all of Europe. And you can see that at this scale, what we're picking up corresponds very, very clearly to a marker of economic activity. So if we look at the GDP by countries in Western Europe anyway, it correlates very well to the, the centrality analysis of the streets in that area. We can see where the economic activity is likely to be based on the street network. Um, we can also pick up other things. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because um, it's uh, very briefly that um, this is an analysis of New York showing if Central Park didn't exist, essentially Central Park would be the area of least economic uh, and, and, uh, and traffic use. So Central Park, if the streets went right through it, this centrality analysis shows that, that that's the place that you would build Central Park um, if, you were, uh, if you were planning Central Park. Um, and of course, the same thing happens with an example here with, a, with an analysis of random walking which is something I've been working on more recently, where instead of the centrality of the network, we're looking at sending out agents effectively to walk over the street network. Um, and over time, they converge on something that corresponds very closely to human traffic. So these random agents with no knowledge of the graph, with no um, uh, memory, past or present or future uh, goals, correspond very closely to how actual people walk through the network which doesn't say that we have no goals, but it says that the configuration of streets is highly relevant to where we will go, just as uh, it is for these random agents. Now that's a scale thing, but we can also deal with complexity. Um, so here's an example of very complex analysis, computational fluid dynamics analysis by Sam Wilkinson. You can see the complexity of fluid throw, flow, uh, wind, through a complex uh, area of the city. And this is a very complex calculation to do, but you can train a neural network in this case, based on some data to make a fast approximation of that. You can see on the left, um, I believe the left is the actual value from computational fluid dynamics. The one in the center is uh, an approximation using the neural network. So very, very little difference between the two. And in fact, the output is faster or it's better, depending on where you are on the curve, than any other existing method. So there are fast methods for doing computational fluid dynamics, uh, and this is more accurate. There are more accurate methods. You could use a wind tunnel, and this is much faster. But it's in terms of speed and accuracy, it's faster or better than all existing methods. We can also interpret things that uh, we don't have any intuition about, but we get in data in abstract ways, such as energy use. So we've got lots of energy use data, energy performance certificates and so on. And if we train a neural network to uh, estimate energy use in buildings based on things that uh, are useful to a designer, so things, variables like um, the shape of the building, the orientation of the building, the amount of glazing, the sort of cladding systems used and so on, things that we control, we realize that there are certain of those parameters that have a, a clearly defined effect on energy use. Even um, if we ignore, even if we don't know what the, the human side of things is going to be, if we don't know how people are going to act inside the buildings. These things have um, very good um, deterministic roles or very good uh, predictive capacity at least. And the neural network is able to outperform existing benchmarks by, by about, uh, I believe, 25 to 40% for better predictions of energy use. Uh, the last couple of videos, just to end, um, 
one of the kinds of uncertainties, several of the kinds of uncertainties that we might be dealing with are uncertainties in dealing with the real world over time, robotics, for instance. So this example of some work, uh, Mohammed Dawood's work, is looking at um, using a robot to build a, a wall with arbitrarily shaped pieces. Might be stones, in this case, it's, um, it's cleaner blocks that are made. But it's using a machine vision approach to estimate uh, or to match blocks to the kinds of shapes that it might expect to find. Uh, this is an example of training a robot to learn something that is probably even more uh, intuitive, which is to carve wood with a chisel. Um, so Giulio Bernaro's work, his PhD work, was looking at the, um, the variability of wood, which as a, a master craftsman who's used a chisel for years, obviously the grain, the density, all of these things, you intuitively know how to manipulate the chisel in order to get the best cut. But these aren't the sorts of things that you can easily program. They're very dependent on the kind of learned skill. So over time, by making lots and lots of cuts, you learn this sort of thing, and the computer can do the same thing. So in this case, it's taking data from, to start with, from a person manipulating the chisel. And then if I fast forward this a little bit, you can see that then we can set up the computer to make its own tests, essentially to learn from its own experience what sort of cuts are best in which sort of grains and so on. So by a developing a feel essentially for the kinds of uh, moves that change the kind of cutting and eventually it learns to become proficient in estimating the kinds of cuts that you'd need depending on the variable grain direction, the grain density, the type of wood and so on and to produce things that are um, effectively taking the optimal amount of material out without getting stuck and uh, making effective cuts throughout. So again, a kind of intuition. Uh, this is an example, a structural example. So starting off with ideas like this, you can see on the left, uh, Ryan Mahana and Ilichir did uh, some work with, uh, in this case, a kind of truss that moves around um, that learns to know she learns to walk through its environment, but culminating in the sort of thing you see on the right, where Ryan's work was about making buildings that can be self-stable, that can respond to uh, forces acting against them. And in this case, in the end, um, not just responding to say wind loads and stuff, but if the whole thing is collapsed, it can learn to right itself and stand up again. If we extend that to something at um, full scale, we get something like Gennaro Senatore's work here on an adaptive truss, which as you can see here, he's walking on the truss and it's got, instead of um, taking all of the stiffness out using material, it's got actuators, which are about to turn off, you'll see in a moment. And you'll see the truss is much less stiff without the actuators. The actuators provide that stiffness that otherwise you'd need a lot more material, a lot more steel and a lot more depth in the truss to actually provide. Now, you can see there's a little bit of a, a wall here as he walks back, and you'll see it in the next bit where people are actually applying load. This is this seems to be a, a lack of stiffness, but in fact, it's just a lag. It's the fact that the, the actuator, you can see it's responding to it again. So the actuators just haven't been able to anticipate the load changes. Now, in theory, they could. With sensors in the right place, with better algorithms to anticipate, to, to learn how load changes and so on. Um, using the sorts of things in a fluid dynamic situation that Sam Wilkinson did, effectively, that becomes not a physical problem, but a problem of information in getting that stiffness down to next to nothing. And the final example I'll show is um, an example by Felix Fair, um, which is a machine learning example to take a, a very complex surface, any surface you would like, and turn it into an instrument by effectively catching the vibrations from contact microphones and then figuring out where on the surface it's being tapped. Now, the example that you saw at the beginning there um, is something where you can put several contact microphones down on the surface at corners of a table, for instance, tap on that table, then triangulate back depending on how long it takes for the vibration to reach each of those uh, contact microphones. Now, in, this, in that case, if you have three or four contact microphones, it's relatively easy to do that triangulation. And you can pinpoint where the finger is 
within about one or two centimeters. Uh, but after that, the task was to see whether you don't need three or four contact microphones. You could do it in two or even one. And it turns out that you can train a network to effectively learn how the vibrations pass, vibrate, um, reverberate off the edges, reflect off the edges of the table. As long as you have one single microphone position off center on the table, it's able to learn essentially the effective shape and size of the table, how vibrations flow through it, and you can tune it to recognize the area of the table you're tapping. So, using machine learning, you can take it down from four to three to two, and eventually to one contact microphone, which learns all of the complexities of the surface. And you can apply it to any surface you like. And in the end, after this, went to uh, apply it on the surface of a, a large scale, two story high structure that people can go around with cap and uh, form this sort of public collaborative music. Which in some ways takes us back to the kind of idea of conversation that we started with right at the beginning of the lecture. So that's where I want to end, um, again, with the idea that this is a collaboration. So when I talked about the Turing test as the first example, the thing about the Turing test was it is a conversation. It's a conversation between the interrogator and the computer, uh, speaking against one another, but coming from completely different points of view. Uh, it's a test that isn't like a scientific test in the sense that we don't know uh, beforehand what the actual criteria are, but they're evolving over time. It's the matter for the interrogator to come up with those in this dialogue, in this social process. In the end, that's what design is all about as well. In the end, that's what a design crit is about. And in the end, that's what we need computers to do if they're going to participate as actual artificial intelligences in design. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sean, for for this um, for this amazing lecture. Super interesting as always. Uh, so we have a bit of time now for those who actually want to ask any questions. If you can, please raise your hands or uh, perhaps put it on the chat. I'm just trying to. I'm struggling a bit. Here we go. Here we go to the chat. Uh, if you raise your hands or leave anything in the chat. Um, anybody has any questions? Should I open up the chat and see, or are you moderating for me? Yes, I'm I'm looking at the chat. Somebody has left. Uh, Mm, I have been wondering if something like uh, telepathy would allow an individual to communicate their subjective understanding, or if it would just be dis dissociated from the network of understandings, it would oof, make, uh, it would be part of. I think it's a bit of a there's a bit of a uh, sort of a syntactic error there in the right yeah, I, I, I can interpret that. I think, I mean, unless unless that person is is available and wants to refine a little bit more, I I take this to um, to mean can we communicate directly from mind to mind? I was talking about the difference in the the sort of internal model that I have in my mind and how that differs essentially from what's in your mind and the fact that we can only communicate via real examples in the world. And um, I mean, I I don't think there's any. There's a, I don't think there's any evidence, scientifically credible evidence, that suggests that telepathy exists, and I suspect it can't um, for, for that reason. It, it doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, I, I don't know what it would mean to actually be able directly to read someone else's mind, because although we have similarities in our brains, our brains are structurally similar, you know, we're evolved in similar ways, so there, there are ways in which they overlap we all have different experiences and our minds are made up of effectively a lifetime of, of different ways of seeing the world. So I, I don't think there is any way personally without some sort of uh, language um, to, to actually communicate. 
uh, other than linguistically, which is which is as I say a language a linguistic is uh, is a convention that we've decided on or in in many ways which i think is more important and and not so well understood by looking at shared examples of things in the world and coming to our own conclusions about what they are and by having those shared examples we eventually have minds that uh, tend to agree on things and see things in similar ways although not identically i think I have a question. I think it was quite interesting the moment you you quoted that sort of like diagram connecting the person, the designer, the field or the, the receptive field that is going to critique that, that design and, and the domain or that, that repository. Do you see any given time computers being able to navigate those three, uh, those three or that triangle? And is it that uh, Navigating that tri triangle efficiently is the key uh, for what we would call uh, creativity. Well, uh, I, I is think there so any I... software trying to do that? Is there any group of people? Does it actually make sense, or or are we just wasting our time and just having fun, but not really making anything meaningful by trying to do so? Yeah. So I think so. The, the, I mean, the, the diagram obviously is is a is a theory for um, you know how this it's a description of how the system works, how the system of creative individuals interact with one another, and uh, you know we could we could uh, refine it or, or disagree on there are various versions of that um, where people have taken it and tried to refine it and so on. Uh, I think that that basic uh, initial example by Chick Mihai is probably the easiest and the best for our purposes. Um, because I think it conveys the general gist of things. But I think the, the essence of it is that an individual mind is, is at that individual by definition. Um, and every individual is different. So there are individuals comprising the field, but from the point of view of an individual creator, we're talking about that as the individual. And the field exists as a sort of series of judges. And they might change, of course. Um, and they might, um, they might have different social relationships to us. But the point is that if we're thinking about um, creativity, it's a process, but the individual creative agent, whether it's a computer or a person, is always at the same point in that diagram. It's always the individual. Now, one thing that I think we, we don't acknowledge, I think, is that in many cases, we, we try to program either the domain or the field. You know, we try to set the, the shared knowledge of the field. We say that if, if the field represents the, the, that sort of third world of knowledge that Popper would call it the third world, the shared knowledge, you know, the knowledge of, of Shakespeare's um, Hamlet or the American constitution. The, typically what we do, I think when we're, when we're coding something, you know, if we're making a parametric model um, or any kind of computational uh, attempt, we typically try to go in at that level. And we say, well, this is what the knowledge is going to be. I'm going to set it down in stone. Our artificial intelligence has, has done that for, for many years. Many of the, um, the, the examples of artificial intelligence are about setting that knowledge, that shared knowledge, um, coming up with an ontology, let's say. There's a long going project, um, uh, Douglas Lennett's project, CYC, Psych, um, that's been going on since uh, the 70s or uh, I think the late 70s or, or definitely the early 80s, which has, it, it's an old school uh, AI project, which essentially tries to construct an ontology of all of the world, you know, saying these are the ways that things in the world relate to one another and we'll code that. And once we get all that basic knowledge, then other AI can use it. Now it's, it's useful, potentially. It's getting to the point now where it's apparently actually useful for doing various things. But it's fundamentally different from how we interact with the world because we are not given direct access to this third world of objective knowledge. We only have our own subjective knowledge. Mm. And in the context of design, the fact that we have different ideas about the world is what drives it. It's the fact that we disagree on things and we, we come to resolutions. We see, you know, in, in the context of design crit, um, we'll look at the project differently and everyone will have their own ideas. And everyone will discuss those ideas because they see the world differently. And in the end, the process of design is that going around the loop to refine it further by taking into account all of these different ways of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it, I don't think it's up to a, a computer to do the whole loop. It's up to the computer. Um, some people might say it's up to the computer to be the field or the domain, but I think it's up to the computer to be the individual. And that's effectively what I'm uh, saying here. 
that's maybe a clearer way of saying it than I said it in the lecture. But that doesn't the individual somehow try to do that, like try to close the loop when it's trying to innovate, when it's trying to, to create, no? like trying to assess how it's being judged, but how it's going to fill it, fill it later. And yes, well, the, the, field is, the field is comprised of individuals as well. That, that, yeah. that's, that's important. So, so the individual is, is able to, to produce uh, you know, creative output, but they're also able to evaluate others' creative output. And it's, it, both of those things are essential. But in terms of how that acts, what, one thing that diagram doesn't show is that there's lots of individuals. Right? Every individual has that diagram. And, and you know, in most cases, well, in all cases, that the field is just other individuals within that community. So they might be other people or, or potentially other computers. It might be, um, you know, it might be a case of, in the case of, let's say, uh, a computer that is able, I give the examples of computational fluid dynamics, you might use that in the context of optimization, but more likely, if you've got something that's that's estimating the effect of computational fluid dynamics, what it's telling you is is, is effectively criticizing uh, your suggestion. I say I want to do this, and it'll come back with no, that's not going to be good because your cladding is going to fall off, the pressure is going to be too high, sort of thing. So, so the computer can act as a as an individual, but it can also act as a member of the field. I think not unrelated to this, we have this question by Mike. Do you think in the future that AI will have the capacity to make the same intuitive leaps we make as designers and engineers, which at times are almost nonsensical in comparison to the original idea whilst being limited by the structured way in which we feed data to the intelligent systems and the fundamental difference in their structure of intelligence? Yeah, so I, I think that then this is the interesting thing that if if you think that um, if if you see the, the world as as actually fitting into this defined structure, uh, you know where where you can parameterize everything or represent everything, um, and that's given it's the same for all of us, then you can imagine well an original idea is is a big leap in that space to somewhere else. So it seems nonsensical uh, at first, and then you realize it makes sense. Um, it, it's it's a concept that that also relates to. Um, Often creativity is defined, and I didn't get into this here, but it's defined as, as both um, having uh, novelty and utility. So something is, is obviously new, but it's also useful. And both of these things are important. And those things seem to be at, at odds with one another, right? Because if you have something that's brand new, well, it, we're not sure how, how useful it's going to be because we've never seen it before and it seems rather odd to us. Um, but in fact, if, if you imagine that everyone isn't seeing the world the same way, everyone isn't locked into the same kind of representation, but you and I have completely different ideas about what is, what, what is the right thing to do or what is the normal thing to do. Well, in fact, then everyone can just do, if, if I make the decision that seems the, the most sensical to me, the most logical to me, but you see the world in a different way, what I'm doing might seem completely surprising to you. So I'd be doing something that just seems completely normal, not novel at all, but totally useful. And you might see it as something that seems like a, a great leap of creative genius, but it's not intentional to me. Now, I think a lot of creativity happens that way. Of course, as, as individuals, we might try to create something that's, that's uh, novel and, and creative. And, and there's, you know, particularly, I suppose, in the past hundred years anyway, there's been a, a great celebration of individual creative genius. But in many ways, you don't really need that. You just need someone who sees the world a little bit differently to do something that they think is the right thing. And because you hadn't seen the world in that way, it looks like a, a, a great leap, almost nonsensical, as you put it. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I think we are a bit... Uh... I think we're on time now uh, to close it off here. Um, so it's been really a, a great session. So thanks a lot, Sean, You're for, welcome. Um, for the lecture. It's been completely fascinating and we've actually quite a lot of audience uh, and definitely interesting discussion so far. The only thing before closing off today would be to let you all know, we have uh, Rafi Canadol in the next session, next Monday. Uh, so we definitely would ask you all to come and stop by if you have time on next Monday, 1 p.m. But other than that, really, thanks a lot, Sean, for, for your contribution. You're very uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. And definitely to, to, uh, 
happy to meet you in the future. And if you can all, if you want all of you to unmute your phone, you can say thank you and clap or give a, give a short <laughs> bye to Sean. Thank, thank you very much. much.